Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. All right, this is uh, 1 John three twenty four. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world, but by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh of the God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. But this, but by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Thanks, Mike, for your commanding presence. Uh, we are back in the book of First John uh, after a couple month break. Um, I want to bring you guys back in to kind of the context uh, of this book. I don't want to assume that everything that happened in the fall uh, stuck. Um, But the book bears the name John because it's written by John. Who is this John? Well, he's the beloved disciple of Jesus turned leading apostle. He is now in his old age. He is the last living disciple. Jesus had 12 of those, right? You've seen them all in the Last uh, Supper. Well, Jesus, it turns out, actually had an inner circle of three, and John was included in that inner circle of three. That means he got to go places and hear Jesus say things that the others didn't get to hear or get to go. But John would actually take it a step further and claim, no, actually, I'm not just a part of the three. I'm the one. I'm Jesus' favorite. I'm the beloved disciple. And he got away with saying this because he was the only one left alive. And so there was no one there to challenge him and say, come on, man. What are you talking about? Why do you do this? Why have you always done this? We've been following Jesus for a long time, and you're stuck on this. There was no one there to contend for the title of the one, and so he is the one. He's writing to a region of churches in modern-day Turkey, uh, and a really important handoff is being made from the first generation of followers to the next. So from these eyewitnesses, The truth about Jesus is being handed off. It's a major transition and people are holding their breath. Have you ever been a part of a transition where everyone's holding their breath? I mean, of course, we're hoping for the best, but we're kind of planning on the worst because it's a really common thing to say it's not been the same since they left right? Have you ever experienced this on a campus, losing a beloved administrator? Have you ever experienced this in a church? Have you ever experienced this in your department or maybe with a sports program? I can tell you all of Alabama is holding their breath right now, you know, hoping for the best, but probably planning on the worst. Not just anyone comes after Nick Saban. So John is determined to pass the baton in a way that won't be dropped. And he's determined and he keeps saying like, stay the course, 
Stay the course. Stick with what you heard from the beginning. Don't get carried off into something new and something novel. Trust our testimony. And he keeps saying, we walked with Jesus. Like we walked with him. So don't listen to somebody else who didn't walk with him. We talked with him. Our ears heard these messages and our hands touched him. So don't be led away from the way that we've been leading you. He's saying this because he has led these churches for many years, but now new leaders are rising up and leading people away from John's leadership, leading them away from his teaching, leading them away from his authority, and ultimately leading them away from his Jesus. And so ideas and new beliefs are threatening the future of this church. This is the context. This church is divided. Some have departed. That's, he, he refers to those people as those who've gone out from us. The book is addressed actually to those who have remained. The church is divided. Some have departed, but the book is addressed to those who have remained. So John is not trying through this book to confront those who left on Facebook. That's not the tone of this book. He's trying to secure the people that have stayed, and he's not arguing with the outsider. He's edifying the insider by saying, stay the course. Is that good? We all clear? All right. Did you remember all of that? Of course you did. So did I. <laughs> so I want to start here in this text. We started in, uh, we're, we're, we're going to take on 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And I want to start with the command John gives. Chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. So the command is twofold. Don't buy it. The second command, test it to see whether it's from God. There's negative commands all throughout this book. Can you think of one in 1 John? Negative commands that are a springboard into positive instruction for John. Don't do this. Instead, do this. How about do not love the world or the things in the world? John often uses these negative commands and he launches in. And there's a bunch of things implied in this command, but I want to mention a few that are probably fairly obvious. The first thing implied in this command is that there are other spirits besides the Spirit of God. So there's a sort of cosmic conflict, a war for the, air, for, for the airwaves that's being presented. And, and, and it's important to think, like, what is meant by spirit? I mean, I think we all read this and can assume, I think I know what John is saying when he says this, but what's meant by spirit? Does that mean that when the ghost of Christmas past visits you and speaks to you, Ebenezer, you know, that it's like, don't tune in to what that ghost is saying to you. No, he, he has in mind an utterance or a message that's inspired by another spirit, but coming out of a person who is motivated by another spirit. So this isn't a don't address Casper when he appears to you. This is examine the messages and the messenger who is claiming to be inspired by the Spirit of God because, beloved, there are other spirits at work. The second thing that's fairly obvious from this command but worth saying is that what you're dealing with won't be that obvious. If he has to say, test it. If he has to say, examine it. He's assuming that it won't just be clear, that you're going to have to put some time in to try to sort out what's being said. If it were obvious, John wouldn't have to warn him, would he? If it were clear, he wouldn't have to communicate this. And the whole Bible, 
from Genesis to Revelation is clearly warning. What makes a lie particularly destructive is not that it's blatantly false, but that it contains elements of the truth. And so he's saying, hey, you should sort through this. You should take a good look at what's being said. Most great lies are very broadly accepted. The other thing that's interesting about this command is that John seems to be saying that unbelief is a sign of faith and maturity. And this is kind of confusing for us because faith can sometimes come to mean not thinking things through. Like, just, just go on faith, brother. Don't think about it. Like, the more faith you have, the less critically you think. That can sometimes be our definition of faith. And this is really tough because we're told in 1 Corinthians 13 that love believes all things. And we know at least that part of the posture of faith is leaning in and believing. But Paul is saying, no, don't buy it. Unbelief is a part of Christian maturity as well. We'll read on next week, but this is surprising to, for, for many of us to hear that Christian love and faith discriminates. Now, I know that that word's not a great word because it's come to be synonymous with, and paired with race, and it's been ruined because discriminating based on skin or color or race is awful, and it's an affront to the gospel. But just the, 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 the definition of discriminate is to recognize and understand the difference between one thing and another. And Christian faith move past its connection with race, it discriminates. When you open the medicine cabinet, I hope you can discriminate between what's helpful and what's hurtful in the situation you're in. In my house, I have a memory as a child of my mom grabbing eye drops, putting them in my eyes, and I said to her, Mom, these, my eyes are burning. And she's like, it burns. That's what happens. Just keep your eyes shut. It'll burn for a time, and it'll get better. And I'm like, well, Mom, it really burns, like real bad, you know? And she's like, you know, whatever, you know? Then Mom goes and gets her glasses and realizes she's put eardrops in my eyes. And now the, they're like melting the wax in my eyeballs, you know? If you're here and you work as an engineer, I hope that you can discriminate between an acceptable stress load and an unacceptable stress load. I went to knock something out. I was creating like a cubby under our stairs, and there were a couple beams under there that held up the staircase, and I can't discriminate. So I got my dad, because my thought is I can, take, I can tear anything out, right? So I get my dad, because he can discriminate, and say, Travis, you can't just remove that wall. It's holding something up, which is always discouraging. <laughs> and ultimately, this is, this is the crux of, I think, what is being said here, is that not everything that is spiritual is God. The devil, we find out, does morality. He's not scared of it. The devil, we find out, does miracles. He's not scared of it. The devil does goosebumps. The devil does crying. Those aren't automatically a sign that God is at work, and not everything that claims to be spiritual is God. Please don't hear me today baptizing your cynicism. Some of you are like, yeah, see, that's why I don't sing those songs with everybody. I don't want to get caught up in something emotional happening here. I'm discerning the spirits, you know, come on. 
The trick here is to be like the Berean Christians, not gullible, but also not suspicious. Acts 17.11 describes the Berean Jews as of noble character, more noble than those in Thessalonica, for two reasons. One, they received the message with great eagerness, like they were on their toes, they were taking notes, they were sitting forward. They weren't sitting back with their arms crossed, waiting for someone to make a mistake. They were sitting forward, hungry to learn. But then they also examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. This is Paul, mighty in the working of miracles and author of many of the books in the New Testament. And after he gets done preaching, they're like, I'm going to see if that checks up. And Paul's not offended by that. Paul's like, praise God for this. All the problems I'm dealing with in other churches are the result of people being eager and superstitious and not examining and taking a good look at what was said and the spirit behind it. So here's what we're going for. Receiving things with eagerness, but also examining. Superstition, no. But being suspicious, that's not it either. Why don't you turn to the person you're sitting next to? You don't even have to if it's your spouse, because they know. But if you were going to fall off on a side of the horse, would it be superstition and being gullible or superstitious and sitting back? Why don't you share that with the person you're sitting next to? Next, I want to jump to the context. Next, I want to jump to the context that John describes because context is key. Micah, come up here. Micah, come here. Yeah, come on. Come on. Hey, context, context is key. The context of a command is really important. If Micah and I are on the battlefield and I yell the command, get down, what do you do? I, I get down. Yeah, I would if I were you. I would get down. Go ahead. <laughs> we say get down. Okay, now we're on a dance floor. Micah and I are on a dance floor together and I scream, get down. What are you doing? I'm, I'm getting down. You're dancing. You totally. You've climbed a tree and I yell at you, get down. Does that mean dance or drop or does that mean safely climb down the tree? Uh, probably safely. I would have to go with Let's give it up for Micah. <laughs> when you hear a command, it's a good idea to take a look at the context that surrounds it. So what's the context of him commanding us? Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits. The context is described in the verses that follow. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. So that's one reason. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world and at work already. And I want to say, although this sounds kind of wild, his context is our context and it is the context of the entire Bible. The truth is going forth and counterfeits are being raised up. It was his context, it's our context, it's the context of the entire Bible. I know when you read this, you're like, false prophets, man? What are you talking about? Do you know how many messages you receive that promise salvation if you turn to someone or something? Are you aware of how bombarded you are with messages and messengers that promise salvation if you turn to someone or something? Are you tired? 
Are you fat? Are you worn out? Are you wrinkled? Are you bald? Do you need to get out of here? Every day, all day, messages that promise salvation from our perceived hell. Antichrists, I'm not dealing with antichrists. Maybe divorce this from the picture you've seen in the Left Behind series of a certain character. An antichrist, we're told there's many, and there's many at work even now. Anti meaning against Christ or instead of Christ. Do you know how many alternatives are coming your way? This is John's context, this is our context, and this is the context of the entire Bible. John has a gospel. He records the life and the teachings of Jesus as well. It also bears his, his name. But he, he heard Jesus declare that the devil is the father of lies, some sort of source of deception, and that when he lies, he's speaking his native language. And the idea that's laid out is something like this. The devil is the source of deceptive ideas. It plays on our own flesh, our own disordered desires. And this gets worked out as we gather in what is a sinful society or what John would describe as the world. From the very beginning, very first page of your Bible, God's giving instruction and the devil's there twisting the truth. Have you heard the story of Adam and Eve and that tree? If you haven't, here's how it goes. God says, dangerous tree, don't eat it, it'll make you dead. Then Satan says, good tree, eat it, it'll make you wise. Able to discern good and bad. Beloved, test the spirits. Move with me to Moses. This is wild. I, I wish that I had so much longer uh, than I do. Move with me to Moses in Deuteronomy 13. God's giving law and instruction, and here's the command. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or a wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. That's a bad dream. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall not walk after the Lord your God in fear. Wait, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments. Obey his voice. Serve him. Hold fast to him. What's he saying here? Signs and wonders are, are signs and wonders. They point to God and they cause us to wonder about him. If they point to someone else and cause us to wonder about someone else, well, that's not a good sign, and that's not the kind of wonder you want. Jesus talks about these bunk signs and wonders in Matthew 7. I wish I could read the whole chapter if you want to be very Berean, because I am discriminating right now. Then you would go read all of Matthew 7. But I want to take you to a really tough saying from Jesus in Matthew 7. He says, Enter through the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. Only a few find it. What a tough message. On the heels of it, right after it, he says, Watch out for false prophets. What do you think the connection is there? Probably a message that says, wide is the way that leads to life, and narrow is the path that leads to destruction. Watch out for someone whose message is, wide is the way that leads to life, and narrow. There's only a few people on the path that leads to destruction. Guys like Hitler, that kind of stuff, right? Watch out for the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. Paul, after spending three years planting a church, he left some elders in place, and this is his farewell to these elders. He's not going to see them again. He knows it. 
And he also warns them of these wolves that are so cool and cuddly on the outside, but on the inside, ferocious. Keep watch over yourselves. That's awesome right there. Keep watch over yourself and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise, distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember, listen to how he describes his ministry. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Peter, another one of Jesus's close followers, one in the, the inner three, He's describing how we get the scriptures in chapter one of second Peter. And he says, hey, above all, you got to understand no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's saying the spirit of God inspired the scriptures. Read on. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. I think that's so interesting that he says they're going to secretly introduce. The idea is this. You're going to have to test the spirits because no one's leading a class called Heresy 101. That's not how this works. The devil doesn't send people out saying, don't believe in Jesus. Rather, follow me. You'll find me. I'm the guy dressed in red. I'm the only guy with a tail. And if you can't find my ponytail, look for my pointy pitchfork. That's not how this goes, is it? Of course, think this through. Of course they'll appeal to scripture. Of course they'll appeal to Jesus. Of course they'll acknowledge him as one thing, but not as another. And so it's Jesus, right? It's like, oh, we believe in Jesus. Jesus the teacher, it's amazing. Jesus the prophet. Jesus the progressive. Jesus the American. Jesus the healer. Jesus the Marxist. Jesus the Republican, another Jesus. Of course they'll appeal to him. And the Spirit of God, we find out in this text, will point us to Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus, the Son of God, the risen, exalted, eternal, uncreated, Lord of heaven and earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The Spirit of God is always pointing to Jesus as the Son of God. And this is how we tell. This is how we discern. This is what John says to us. The criteria by which we discern this, if it's so difficult, by this you will know the Spirit of God Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now in the world already. The spirit of God is pointing to Jesus as God. And he's exalting Jesus as fully God and fully man. To this day, 
very day, it's really typical for what we would call false religion to mess with either the divinity of Jesus or the humanity of Jesus. And there's a particular trouble that they're facing in this church. Um, and it's it, the trouble they're facing in this church is around what we celebrated over Christmas, the incarnation, the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. The idea of the God-man is under attack here. And it's being fed by a bigger idea, which we know to be Gnosticism. This kind of baptized Greek way of thinking has infiltrated uh, the church. It's part pagan, part Persian, part Judaism, part Christianity, part Greek philosophy, so it's difficult to discern. But the big idea is the body is bad, matter doesn't matter. The physical is inferior, and the spiritual is superior. And so what it was claiming is that, no, God didn't come as a man because the body is bad. How could it be that God came in the flesh? And then the idea was this, hear me out, that suffering was bad. So you can, even if you're new to church, you're probably like, oh, I can see why John's got a problem with this. Isn't this what this is all about, that God came in the flesh and suffered for our sin? Je didn't Jesus die for our sins? And don't we have such a great high priest because he can connect with us? He understands the situation that we're in. Well, yeah, this is problematic, and John's not having it. Again, Jesus, risen, exalted, eternal, uncreated God, Lord of heaven and earth. That's the message. Look at the contrast in the crowd as we close. Little children, you're from God and you've overcome them. Again, he's assuring the insider, not addressing the outsider. Little, little children, you're from God and you've overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of of error. You, you, little children, you're from God and you've overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I love John's tone here. This is the oldest kind of last living gray haired disciple. And no, normally when someone's invited to test the spirits, the emphasis can become those spirits, the false prophets. We can forget as we read the book of Revelation that the point of Revelation is not the Antichrist or the beast or any sort of timeline or tragedy. The point of Revelation is Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I so appreciate John's tone here because he's been talking to us about false prophets. He's been talking to us about Antichrist. But in the end, he's going to bring our focus not to the present darkness, but on our God who is light and has overcome. I so appreciate that because when we can dip into this reality, it's so easy for us to, to focus on it and be like, the devil's so big. And the media, so powerful. And his army is so vast. And one of the people in his army is Beyonce. And I can't help but to tap my foot to Beyonce songs. We're screwed. That's the tendency that comes over us. And that's not John's tone. After describing all that is false and all the obstacles and all that's in the way, he says, and beloved, you're of God. You're of God. And you can see this small, shrimpy, scared, confused church going, we are? You're of God. And greater, greater is he who is in you than he who's in the world. Really? Yeah. Look, the church has always been dealing with fake news. 
The church has always been dealing with misinformation. We can get so scared, so confused. But we have what they have. We have the scriptures. We have the abiding spirit of God and we can walk by the spirit and we belong to a local church. And so far the church has not been stopped. No obstacle, no barrier. And that's what he's saying. You've overcome them. We have. Yeah, they departed a long time ago and you're here. You're here. You still believe in the virgin birth. I, I do. You still believe in the authority of Scripture. A lot of people have departed. Yeah, I do think that's God's word to me. You believe in the resurrection. And that one day what happened to Jesus is going to happen to us. Yeah, I do. I lose sight of that, as Gunnar said. But then when we worship, I focus back in on that. Yeah, you've overcome them. They bailed and you're here. Well done. You've overcome them. And don't get tempted as you sit here to say, yeah, I have gone the narrow way. It's the Spirit of God that keeps us. It's God's Spirit that keeps us. He was able to do this with this church because this is something that he received from Jesus. John, the disciple, would have remembered being 15 years old. He would have remembered being scared. He would have remembered being shrimpy. He would have remembered being totally confused and Jesus saying, I'm going to go. And then this is what Jesus says to his disciples. If you love me, keep my commands and I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to give you another helper and he'll be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you and he will not leave you as orphans. Worship team, would you guys come? We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What he's saying here is that whoever comes along with a dream or a doctrine, if someone claims a revelation from God, it's got to be subordinate to this apostolic witness and the authority of the scriptures that we have in hand. So how are we going to get through this year? How are we going to get through this election season? The way the church has always gotten through every season. A Bible in hand. The Spirit in our hearts. This abiding witness and belonging to a local community a group of people who know you well enough to not just reinforce what you believe, but to cause you to reconsider what you believe. Would you stand with me? I wanted to invite you to the table to just remember Jesus' commitment to you in this crazy, confusing age. I also wanted to just sow seed and thought right now uh, we're inviting our church on a 40-day digital fast for Lent. Lent starts February 14th, and it goes until Easter on March 31st. So it's Valentine's Day to Easter Sunday. We'll have more information on this, um, but we have a sense that there's quite a bit of noise. And this isn't just preparing us to celebrate Easter, but this is preparing us for this year and the election ahead. We're asking you to take into account what you're taking in. And so we'll do it together, which will make it easier. No one's going to be sending you reels. And I want to ask you just a few questions. Get, just get this started for you. And the questions are these. On your phone and in your life, what's utility and what's distraction? I, I'm not going to answer that for you. You can answer that for you. 
Then the second question is, I'm, we'll invite you to give some things up, but the big question is, what is God calling you to focus on as you give it up? And then, how can your whole family participate? I would start working on your kids uh, right now, letting them know this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it uh, together, but we think it's going to be a wonderful time. Spirit of God, would you lead us? Spirit of God, would you help us? Spirit of God, encourage your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. find Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life And I I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave divine